Welcome back to Inside Rutgers. Hope everyone's semester is going well so far. I'm Dan King. And I'm Karina Gonzalez. We've been back on campus for a little over a month, and now that everyone's settled in, we're here to give you the inside scoop on everything happening on the Rutgers campuses. There's so many cool events that have occurred this past month, from Rutgers' latest research discoveries all the way to meeting our new chancellor here at Rutgers. I'm really excited. I can't wait to see all of this. Me too. Let's get the show started by taking a look at the latest discovery here at Rutgers by our very own Board of Governors professor at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences, Dr. George Carman. I'm George Carman. I'm a Board of Governors professor and a distinguished professor of food science. I'm also the founding director of the Rutgers Center for Lipid Research. We study an enzyme known as phosphatidic acid phosphatase. This enzyme catalyzes the penultimate step in the biosynthesis of triglycerides, or fat. We know from previous studies that this enzyme is involved in the biosynthesis of fat, and too much of the enzyme can cause obesity, but too little of the enzyme can cause another disease known as lipodystrophy. We found that if we eliminate this enzyme, the lipid precursor that is normally channeled to the biosynthesis of fat is instead channeled to the synthesis of lipids that are deposited in biological membranes. This situation increases the chance of diseases such as cancer and inflammatory diseases and other health problems. Our work on lipid metabolism utilizes Baker's yeast as a model system. The advantage of working with Baker's yeast is that cells are easy to grow in large quantities and there's a great deal known about their genetics and molecular biology. This, is allow this allows us to make mutations almost at will so we can study the importance of this phosphatidic acid phosphatase enzyme. In this study, we eliminated the PA phosphatase enzyme. And what we found is that instead of making triglycerides in the cell, the cells would make an increased amount of membrane phospholipids. We found that a critical enzyme that's involved in making membrane lipids was activated, causing an increase in an enzyme that initiated membrane phospholipid synthesis. Furthermore, we found that if we made a mutation in the gene for this enzyme, that we could alleviate the increase in membrane phospholipid synthesis, and the cells would actually look normal in spite of the fact that we had it also eliminated the PA phosphatase enzyme. The synthesis of fat is important because triglyceride is a storage form of energy. The synthesis of triglycerides are also important because they buffer cells from the toxic effects of free fatty acids. The synthesis of membrane lipids is also important because they serve as structural as well as functional components of the membrane that allows cells to grow. What our studies have shown that the balanced synthesis of triglyceride and membrane lipids is very important because disturbing the balance can lead to diseases such as cancer or inflammatory responses or lead to obesity. This implies that if we develop a drug to control the synthesis of fat, we also have to consider the biosynthesis of membrane lipids. So the next step in our research is to understand how to fine tune the activity of this enzyme. And in this way, we can make sure that cells are not making too much fat, but making enough fat, and also that they don't make too much membrane lipids. The phosphatidic acid phosphatase was actually discovered in 1957, when I was only seven years old. For a number of years, researchers tried to identify the enzyme, but because of technical problems, it was not accomplished until 1989 by a student in my laboratory named Yi Ping Lin. From that time onward, people were trying to discover the gene that coded for the enzyme. But again, there were massive technical problems in identifying the gene. It was in 2005 when Gil Su Han found a sample of the enzyme that was deposited there in 1993. By that time, the human genome had been sequenced. 
and through bioinformatics, Gil Suhan was able to identify the human gene encoding for the phosphatidic acid phosphatase enzyme. Through a series of experiments, he established the gene-enzyme relationship. And since that time, researchers all over the world have been studying the phosphatidic acid phosphatase enzyme. It's crazy to think that this one enzyme mm -hmm. can negatively affect you if you have too much of it, and then it can also cause cancer if you just eliminate it completely. Yeah, it's honestly crazy that this one enzyme is one of the biggest reasons for obesity, and it's like, it's shocking to know that, but hopefully I'm just going to keep up with what I'm eating, stay healthy, hopefully I can avoid that. So am I. It's good to know that we even have scientists at our own school that's willing to look out for us and find, get all these amazing discoveries, not only for students, but people all around the world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I don't know what we would do without scientists and their research. And speaking of research, the Weather Watchers recently did some studying on how hurricanes form, so you should check that out just to be safe. With storms like Harvey and Irma impacting the lower parts of the U.S., Hurricanes have been a hot topic in the news recently. Many are aware of the catastrophic damage they can bring, but very few are aware of how they are formed. Here we are at the Environmental and Natural Resources Building on Cook Campus, home of the Rutgers Meteorology Department. Let's head over to Dr. Decker, one of the directors of the Meteorology Department, to learn more about hurricanes such as Irma and Harvey. So a hurricane relies on the heat and moisture from a warm ocean surface and it turns that heat energy into kinetic energy or the motion of the winds going around the storm through rising air. So we have thunderstorm activity building over the warm ocean waters and over time that eventually spins up the hurricane. The late summer into the fall that's when our ocean temperatures are the warmest. So August, September, October of our warmest ocean waters, that's going to give us our greatest hurricane threat. We had really three storms back to back to back when we include not just Harvey and Irma, but also Jose, still spinning in the Atlantic. And all three of those storms made it not just to category three status, but they're up to category four, at least at one time or another during their life. And that's the first time we've ever had three category four storms back to back to back in the Atlantic Ocean. So there are a few uh, tropical disturbances out in the Atlantic right now, in addition to Jose, and those will pose a threat over the next few weeks as they move uh, closer to North America. And uh, the forecast is still for the season as a whole to be an active season, so even though as we head into October, climatologically things should start to quiet down. There's still certainly the possibility of more activity. I guess the number one rule is to follow any instructions from your local emergency managers. If you are right near the coast, you want to move inland so you're not affected by the storm surge. If you're near a river valley, you want to move towards higher ground so any freshwater flooding doesn't affect you and you don't get swept away by that. If you're not in a very well-built structure, like say you're in a mobile home, you'll want to move to a sturdier shelter to survive those strong winds. Thanks Dr. Decker. I hope that information blew you guys away. Stay safe during hurricane season. I'm weather watcher Ashley Cornish. Catch you later Rutgers. It's so sad to hear the stories and to watch on the news about people that are affected by hurricanes, especially Puerto Rico right now. I know. I'm half Puerto Rican, so I have family that still live there. And to hear the conditions that they had to live in is really sad. But it's getting better now because some of them came back to the United States and some of them just went to another part of the island where they have power. Mm -hmm. I'm half Puerto Rican, and for the first few weeks I couldn't hear back from my family that we had there, and it was scary. But eventually they found some way to give us the heads up that they were okay. And that was good, but it's also scary that not everyone ends up that way. I know, I totally agree. This country, along with the Caribbean and Mexico, is taking on a lot right now. And I hope that everything will be turning out for the better for all of us. But thankfully, Rutgers is taking the initiative to help out. Let's take a look at what's going down. We're holding two events, one that's at Rutgers Newark, and then there's an event in New Brunswick. We are actually working with OpenStreetMap. We are using their editing tools to trace buildings using pre-event satellite imagery. So this is before Hurricane Maria hit. And what that does is it helps relief workers on the ground figure out where things are supposed to be because often those buildings are no longer there. We are all deeply affected by this. A lot of our students are of Puerto Rican or other Caribbean descent. 
and a lot of people in New Jersey, as well as our faculty and some of our administrators. So, you know, we feel like this isn't happening thousands of miles away. It's happening right here. It's, it's happening to, to our friends and family. A lot of our family members are very, they're of a hardy stock. They tell us to calm down, tranquilo, like it's okay, we're okay, but we also know that resources are having a hard time reaching them. Being afar, it's just really hard to find a clear solution of what to do. So as soon as I saw this opportunity to help in some way, no matter how little or big it is, I decided just to, I had to come. It makes me very happy to know that people are helping out with um, Puerto Rico during their time of need. Yeah, I agree. It's great to know that Rutgers is always looking out for the community. Well, guys, it looks like it's time for a break. We'll be right back after this with more Inside Rutgers. Do you like kicking back in your free time? Sometimes the dorms can get stuffy and boring. So head on over to the Rutgers Zone. Need somewhere to watch sports? Need to satisfy that ice cream craving? Or are you tired of your old video games? Rutgers Zone is where you need to visit. Enjoy some games, food, TV, karaoke, and so much more. And don't forget to ask for those ice cream toppings. With all of the cool things at the Rutgers Zone, why would you even leave? If you are on Livingston campus, make sure you swing by the Rutgers Zone, just a bus stop away. For more information, please visit zone.ruckers.edu. Welcome back to Inside Rutgers. You know, it's always good to be able to catch up with fellow Rutgers students and see how things are going for them. Mm-hmm. I feel the same way. Fall is when all the big activities start to happen, and I just love to take a part of it. Exactly. Let's check out Hit the Streets, where you'll see me catch up with the students and find out what fall activities they have planned for the semester. Hey, Rutgers. The leaves are falling, and it's getting chilly outside. But that's not stopping us from heading to the yard to check out with the students to see what they're doing this season. Are you looking forward to the change in temperature? Oh, definitely, yeah. I have all of my, uh, summer, uh, my summer clothes packed up and everything. I have all my sweaters out, so I'm excited. <laughs> I'm kind of sick of like walking around campus and being all sweaty and gross. Yeah, I kind of just want to wear like, you know, like nice fall jackets and just having the wind just blowing and stuff. Yeah, and the scenery change is nice too, so that's a thing. I really like layering my clothes and some jackets, and I really enjoy wearing scarves. So, uh, looking forward to wearing a scarf sometime soon. Yeah. Um, I love scarves. As you can see, um, scarves make everything better, and I hate when my neck is cold, so they're a super necessity. I'm definitely a fan of bundling up in clothes. I'm sp specifically a fan of large scarves that can be blankets as well as scarves. Um, hats and gloves are cool, haven't gotten those out yet. Jackets, big jackets, they're good. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but I love when the weather changes and I can't wait for more of it to come. Catch us next time when we hit the streets, Karina Gonzalez, RUTV. Honestly, just hearing them talk about what they'll be for Halloween makes me really excited. Me and my best friend, we're both gonna do a pair costume and be giraffes. It's crazy, but I'm excited for it. Also, I can't wait for it to get cold because I have all these long sleeves and jackets lying in the closet and I can't wait to take them out. That's so cool. I actually can't wait to see what you're going to be in your costume. I plan on dressing up as a cheerleader from the movie Bring It On. Me and all my friends are going to be the entire squad. They're called the Clovers. Yeah, I know. I love Halloween because all these funny costumes come out and sometimes some of them are really eye-catching and especially Rucker social media, they always shine a spotlight on one or two of them, so I love seeing that. Speaking of students that get the spotlight, Nick Seriano, a Rutgers wrestler who transferred from Penn State, is known for being the nationally ranked number two wrestler in the entire nation. Let's take a look and learn more about our shining night. Well, I've been wrestling for about 13 years. Um, I'm 20, so started when I was seven years old and I've uh, been training hard ever since. It's, it's, it's my life. I just love competing and uh, it comes down to comes down to me you know it's one-on-one -on -one and uh, I don't got to rely on a team of people or anything I work hard I put in the work and uh, you know it's it's fun you go out there and compete against another dude and just you know go out you know pose your will on them and it's competitive man it's a fight so I love that I just like the way how wrestling is one-on-one -on -one. it's on you you know you get to go out there you get to put on a show and you put in the work and uh, you know, you get to embrace it when you win, so there's no relying on your teammates or anything like that. Oh, I just want to achieve my goals, and uh, this year I want to be an NCAA champ. 
2018 NCAA champ, and uh, I think that'll catapult. That's, you know, I've worked my whole life for that. Um, and, you know, just take it day by day with my training and, uh, you know, represent Rutgers Wrestling, and it's gonna be awesome. Growing up, being a state champ is uh, pretty much every wrestler's dream. And uh, I set a goal to be a four-time state champ, and uh, just through hard work and commitment and focus, uh, I achieved it. And I think that was uh, that was the pinnacle of my uh, career. I want to be number one, you know. I want to be the champ, but uh, it's it's good, you know. But it's not my goal. My goal is to be number one ranked in the country. So, you know, I have to work every day to achieve that. Just uh, stay focused and. Uh, Chase your, chase your dreams and work hard for it and put in the work, put in the time because your competition is, they're working, they're working just as hard and you gotta outwork them and, you know, and go, go get what you want. Ready? Yep. Wow, that's actually insane that Nick is actually ranked number two in the nation for wrestling. I was never really good at sports, but I did play soccer for two years when my dad forced me in middle school. Yeah, I agree. It's crazy to know that someone on our wrestling team has someone so accomplished that's playing for us and saying, I was never that good either. Yeah, it just <laughs> runs in my family. But we're gonna take a quick break. Please stay with us, we'll be right back after this. As a commuter, it's hard to make connections outside of class. Tell me about it. Did you know that there's a place for commuters to meet up between classes? Hmm, no I didn't. That's right. The Rutgers Commuter Student Organization's primary goal is to serve commuter needs and interests while building a bigger commuter community on campus. Located in the Bush Student Center, the RCSA Commuter Lounge has many appliances that help make commuter lives easier, such as a microwave, a refrigerator, computers, and even a TV. The RCSA also holds events. It's the perfect place to relax, do homework, and make some friends. Don't have classes on Bush? Don't worry, there is a new commuter lounge in the Douglas Student Center as well. The commuter lounges are open every Monday through Thursday from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. and from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. on Fridays. For more information, visit rcsa.rutgers.edu. Thanks for staying with us. If you're just tuning in, we're giving you the latest on everything Rutgers. I'm so proud to be a Rutgers student. It makes me even happier to know that I go to a school where students are actively helping each other out. Yeah, I feel the same way. It's awesome to know we're a part of a community where cooperation plays such a big part. Speaking of cooperation, I visited the Hellier House on Cook Douglas, a living learning community where students work together to accomplish almost everything. Let's check it out. Hey Rutgers, we're here today at the Hellier House, a living learning community where house members work cooperatively with each other to support themselves in a living learning environment. Let's go check it out. Cooperative living began at Rutgers during the Great Depression in the 1930s. Uh, Professor Frank G. Hellier the Dean of Resident Instruction at the College of Agriculture at that time, noticed that many of the students uh, had tremendous financial need. Many of the students were coming off the farm at the time. And uh, in response to that need, he offered them an opportunity to live on campus in exchange for working in various departments and programs. We have like different crews. We have like cooking crew, cleaning crews, and um, so it depends on your schedule, which like crew is gonna fit the most for you. And we also have to clean the bathrooms, we have to clean the living room, and then we have to clean the kitchen after that. One of the most recent additions actually is this agriculture program. This is our first year with this greenhouse, and we also have a chicken coop over there. And all this stuff was started last year as the first year of the agriculture program. And this is the first time we really get to flesh this out and incorporate it into our daily meals. The activity that I like to help out with the most, I haven't done it recently, but the greenhouse definitely. I like to see how things start and then end up in our food. So that's pretty cool to see. Also the chickens, we just got them and I'm really excited to eat eggs. So one of the main projects we uh, got involved in over the last fall and spring was this chicken coop right here. Um, we've recently finished the run to go along with it. That work was done by Adam and some of the other students. Um, I was a carpenter before I came back here to Rutgers and Professor Lubick brought me on to help design this chicken coop that some of the students would be able to pick up, move around, reposition when they wanted to, and with the goal of having a few chickens here to produce eggs that they could actually use to feed themselves in the house. Hell Your House provides a very unique learning opportunity. It gives students real live interpersonal skills, cooperation, leadership, conflict resolution, 
skills that are going to help them in their career someday. We've got a wonderful group of students here at Higher House that are not afraid to work and get their hands dirty. So we wanted a, yet another opportunity for the students to learn how to produce their own food that they could use in the kitchen, how to produce their own eggs, and get some hands-on experience. Well guys, I hope this day at the Hellier House changed your perspective on cooperation because I know I'm thinking differently. I'm Dan King, RUTV. You know, seeing how all those students work together just to meet a common goal, it actually inspires me to help out others more. Yeah, it inspires me too. I always try to help out my friends and family when I can, but after seeing how much they help out, I really have to step up my game. I also was surprised by how much they work in nature and outdoors. I wish I could make time just every few days to be outside. I totally agree, but that actually might not be that hard thanks to Rutgers. Thanks to the classes at Rutgers that are taking students out of traditional classrooms and teaching them in areas called living laboratories. Let's check one out. We are big believers here at Rutgers in engaging students. You learn best what you learn by being active and by being engaged. We're in front of the Institute for Food, Nutrition, and Health. It's a living laboratory. It gives a real world context to what they're learning. The students worked together on this tiny site as a big team to install the plants. Last semester, as part of my planting design class, our final project was to create a design for the border of the meadow. Our design was chosen and installed by the whole class. As a landscape architect, that's really important to get to uh, build your design because you get so many different experiences and learn so much more by actually installing something. We really want all of this to be a learning opportunity designed to be used by the entire Rutgers community. One of the things we learn um, in the meadow is how to identify plants. When you look at a flower, you can see so many characteristics of it that aren't necessarily reflected in the, the pages of a book. Being able to see the plant in person, see how it grows, see what else is around it. You can smell it, you can touch it, and it makes the whole entire thing more tangible and memorable. By engaging them in active learning settings, their curiosity is encouraged rather than thwarted. It is so important to me that Rutgers is trying to build spaces into campus uh, for students to do hands-on learning. I think it shows students that Rutgers does care and that they're looking to make our experience and future students' experiences better and to also improve the entire campus as a whole for us to enjoy and for other people to enjoy as well. It's great to see that Rutgers is doing these updates. Is there any updates with you? Yes, I'm currently planning my next event called Cultural Beauty on November 9th with my organization, Douglas Divas. How about you? Um, I don't really have anything big planned, but I, when I have extra time, I'm teaching the Weather Watchers Learning Living community how to edit because I feel editing is a good skill for anyone to have, no matter your major. Yeah, I agree. Editing is one of those skills that looks great on everyone's resume. Mm -hmm. Well, looking at the time, it's about time to take a break. We'll be back with more Inside Rutgers. Oh, I, I just, oh, I, I don't know, man. I don't know if I can run today. I'm really busy and, wait, what? You're running there? I did not know this. I didn't even know that was a place. Do you know all the places on campus where you can work out and exercise? Well, we do, and we want to share that with you. Werblin Recreation Center is located on Bush Campus on the corner of Freelingheisen and Bartholomew Road. Werblin has everything from badminton courts to an Olympic-sized swimming pool. The Livingston Recreation Center is located on Road 3 off of Joyce Kilmer Avenue. This center has a full weight room, hosts many different classes, and even has a spa located right inside to help you relax after a tough workout or maybe just a tough exam. The Cook Douglas Recreation Center is located on Beale Road, across from the Cook Student Center. This recreation building comes equipped with a fun fitness center, pool, and racquetball courts for those of you who like sports with a little danger. The College Avenue Gym is located directly on College Avenue, right next to the Student Center. This location has multiple gyms and basketball courts, power and conditioning rooms, and is the only location with a rock wall. The Rutgers Fitness Center is located on Easton Avenue on the College Avenue campus. This is the only location that is just a fitness center, so this might be the place for people looking to just work with weights and machines. 
Rutgers also has multiple bike and walking paths that run throughout all the campuses. You can find a map of all the paths at rudocs.rutgers.edu slash bikewalk. Most facilities are open Monday through Friday, 7 a.m. until 11.30 p.m. Weekend hours vary, but you can find out more information about the facilities and their hours at recreation.ruckers.edu. Welcome back, Ruckers. Everyone's getting into the flow of things, and clubs and big events are starting to pop up. Yep, one of the big events that happened so far has been the Black Student Social. Sadly, I wasn't able to attend as I had class, but thankfully, RUTV was able to head over and show me what went down. Let's check it out. Wow, that looked like a lot of fun. I'm sure the food was really good, too. I know. I'm really sad I had to miss it. The music actually sounded really good, too. I know the guy who was DJing. He's actually really popular around campus. Well, there's always next year because I know I wouldn't have minded a s'more or two. I love how not only Rutgers organizations, but Rutgers staff takes the time to plan events like these. Yes, I totally agree. Speaking of Rutgers staff, students had the opportunity to meet with our new chancellor recently. Let's check out a win. Hello Rutgers, I'm Cece Crane and today I'm in the Douglas Student Center for a meet and greet event with Rutgers New Brunswick's new Chancellor, Dr. Detta. Let's go check it out and see what he has in store for Rutgers. I will want Rutgers to be in the upper half in every metric of the Big Ten. Right now, in many we are not. And it's a very simple way of framing the thing that we have to be best at what we do or amongst the best at what we do. So now that we have uh, 13 other institutions in our peer group, by the time I leave, I want Rutgers to be firmly placed in the upper half of the Big Ten. And that includes student success, faculty research, athletics, everything, because all the Big Ten universities you will see are very much across the board. So that's what I would like to see. You know, I'd look for opportunities to meet with student groups, but I won't be able to meet with all 42,000. So we have to find ways by which your important issues are communicated to me, and we are jointly, collaboratively developing solutions. The solutions are not mine to develop, it is for us to develop. So you guys have the ideas, you guys know how things might work or might not work. So let's partner, let's work together, and we'll make things better. Well, Rutgers, as you certainly can see, Dr. Dutta is a great fit for Rutgers New Brunswick and certainly fit to lead us Scarlet Knights. I can't wait to see what he has in store. I'm Cece Crane, RUTV. Our new chancellor seems so nice. Hopefully I'll be able to meet him before I graduate in the spring. Yeah, I went to a Meet the Chancellor event and heard him speak, and he honestly has so many good goals and aspirations to make Rutgers a better place. Wow, you're so lucky. I'm sure he has so much more to offer for the years to come. Well, that is all we have for this episode of Inside Rutgers. Please be sure to let us know if you enjoyed this show, and if you have any comments or suggestions for our next show, you can tweet us at Rutgers TV. And remember, if you miss any parts of this episode or any past episodes, you can check us out online at rutv.ruckers.edu and on our YouTube channel. I'm Karina Gonzalez. And I'm Dan King. We'll see you next time.